For more physics related content, please subscribe. Welcome to the Physics Almanac Stellar Physics 1C Luminosity. In this video, we will be discussing the Eddington luminosity, which applies to radiation dominated stars. We will look at the luminosity for gas dominated stars, and then we will discuss stellar luminosity in general. The physics level in this video is intermediate. So, the Eddington luminosity. Stars in general are supported by a combination of radiation pressure and gas pressure. As a general rule, the more massive a star is, the more it's dominated by radiation pressure as opposed to gas pressure. Most stars, however, are predominantly supported by gas pressure. The Sun, for example, is about 99.9% .9 gas pressure. The Eddington luminosity is defined as the luminosity that a star would have if it were entirely supported by radiation pressure. Going back to our cartoon diagram of a star, gravity is trying to contract the star, and in this case the pressure that's counteracting gravity would just be basically photons pushing outwards. Looking at this in closer detail, in the star we have an electron and a proton. And if a photon comes along, it will scatter off the electron, imparting some momentum onto it. That electron will then drag the proton along with it via the electric force between the two. Recall that the electron is negatively charged and the proton is positively charged, so they attract one another. You may be wondering, why doesn't the photon just scatter off the proton and impart its momentum onto it directly? Now, in principle, Yes, this can happen. However, the scattering cross section for this interaction is proportional to 1 over the mass squared. And an electron is about a thousand times lighter than a proton, and so that would mean that the scattering cross section for the electron is about a million times greater than for the proton. So for each photon that scatters off a proton, about a million will scatter off an electron. This scattering cross section we already discussed in the previous video, Stellar Physics 1b, and it's the Thomson cross section. So while it is true that photons do scatter off protons, we can safely ignore that interaction as it would be a one in a million correction. The Eddington luminosity gets its name from Arthur Eddington, who first derived it. So now let's calculate what this luminosity is. The force on a single nucleus will be the radiation pressure times the cross section, and this has to balance out the force of gravity. So we can write this force as the luminosity divided by the speed of light divided by the surface area of the star times the Thomson cross section. So where did I get this from? If you look at this quantity right here, this is luminosity divided by the speed of light. So luminosity is just energy per second. And for photons, the momentum is just the energy divided by the speed of light. So if we divide energy per second by the speed of light, we get momentum per second. And that's just force. Then, the probability that one of these photons will hit an electron is going to be the electron cross-section, which is the Thomson cross-section, divided by the surface area of the star. The Thomson cross-section, as we discussed in Stellar Physics 1b, is just a number and it's equal to 6.65 times 10 to the minus 29 meters squared. The K here in these parentheses is Coulomb's constant. Now we equate this to the gravitational force on a nucleus with atomic number A and charge Z. This may be a little confusing here because the photons are scattering off electrons, but we're equating it to the gravitational force on a nucleus. This is because all of the mass of the star is contained in the nuclei as one proton is a thousand times heavier than an electron. So the electrons don't really contribute much to the mass of the star. Now I mentioned that the nucleus has a charge Z. This is important because since the star is electrically neutral, there are as many protons as there are electrons. And so Z will tell you the number of electrons per nucleus. And so if this radiation force is being transferred to a nucleus via an electron, it matters how many electrons there are per nucleus, so we have to multiply by a factor of z. We can now cancel the r's and solve for the luminosity. Now here I've rewritten a over z as ye, and typically in a star it's very close to 1. If the star were entirely made up of hydrogen, then it would be exactly 1, 
plugging in all the numbers, we get that the Eddington luminosity is about 10 to the 31 watts times the mass of the star in units of solar masses. For reference, the luminosity of the sun is about 4 times 10 to the 26 watts. Clearly, we can see that the sun is not a radiation-dominated star, as its Eddington luminosity is 10 to 100,000 times brighter than its actual luminosity. If you found this video interesting so far, please like and subscribe, and maybe share it with a few friends. Now let's take a look at gas-dominated stars. This derivation was also first done by Arthur Eddington, so it just as well could have been called the Eddington luminosity. We're going to start with the diffusion equation for photons, which I'm just going to state, as we don't have the thermodynamic tools yet to derive it. So here we have the luminosity, which is just the time derivative of energy. That's going to be proportional to the surface area, times the radial component of the gradient of the energy density. So U here is just the photon energy density, and that's proportional to the temperature to the fourth. If you are familiar with the Stefan Boltzmann law, you will recognize this. Even though I'm just stating this here, we will eventually derive this when we look closer at thermodynamics. This constant D here is called the diffusion coefficient. And it turns out it's approximately equal to one third times the speed of light times the photon mean free path, which we derived in stellar physics 1b. Now, plugging everything in, we get the following expression for the luminosity, where this quantity here is the derivative of the energy density, which recall is just a times t to the fourth. Now we're going to assume that the radial derivative of temperature is of the following form. That is, we're going to assume that the temperature decreases with radius as 1 over r to some constant b. This assumption is not exactly correct, and we'll see that when we look at the internal structure of stars. For one, it clearly can't be true at r equals 0. But since we're ultimately looking at the external luminosity, it's not a bad approximation. Now we're going to use the virial theorem. Recall in stellar physics 1a that we found the following relationship between the gravitational potential energy and the temperature. Plugging everything in at r equals the radius of the star, we get the following expression for the luminosity for a gas-dominated star, where I've used the virial theorem to substitute for t to get this quantity in the parentheses. Since we don't know what b is, I'm going to rearrange this and group all the constants together into one big constant c. Now take a look at this quantity here, 3m over 4 pi r cubed, well, that's just the mass over the volume, so that's density, and since we're already dividing by density, this whole fraction cancels to 1. In order to find C, since we know that the Sun is a gas-dominated star, we can plug in one solar mass and set this equal to a solar luminosity. And so finally we get that for gas-dominated stars, the luminosity is one solar luminosity times the mass of the star cubed in units of solar masses. Finally, let's take a look at real stars, as real stars are a combination of these two models, since they have both gas pressure and radiation pressure. The way this is typically done is that the luminosity is modeled as some constant times the mass raised to some exponent. And that constant will vary depending on which exponent you pick. And then what is done is that this model is fit with empirical evidence for various mass ranges. The most commonly used model is that L equals about 1.4 solar luminosities times the mass in units of solar masses raised to the 3.5. This model only holds for a mass range between about 2 solar masses to 55 solar masses. So as you can see, this doesn't hold for the Sun, because if we plugged in one solar mass into this equation, we would be off by a factor of 1.4. The reason this is probably the most commonly used model is that it covers a large range of star masses, and most stars will fall into that range. If you go outside of that range, you have to change your constant c sub x, and you gotta change the exponent corresponding to it. So for example, if we go below this range, we show that the exponent should be three. And if we go to extremely massive stars that are entirely radiation dominated, we know the exponent should be one. But for a star to be entirely radiation dominated, it has to be very massive. When we look at internal structure, we'll derive the relationship between how much gas and radiation pressure there is for a given star mass. If you found this video interesting, 
subscribe, hit the bell, and stay tuned for Stellar Physics 1D, where we will discuss the basics of nuclear fusion.